let's move on. Uh, let's continue on the theme of KRAS. Uh, <coughs> I mentioned KRAS mutations are the most common uh, mutation in lung cancer. They're about 20, even up to 25% in some series of of uh, mutations that we see, but only a subset of KRAS mutations is uh, has an appropriate target today in 2022 called G uh, sorry KRAS G12C. That's about 12% of lung cancers, and it's important to note that the target that we have or the therapy we have called Sotorasib or uh, Lumacras is its commercial name uh, works for this mutation, but not broadly for every other type of KRAS mutation. Now, adagrastib is another selective KRAS inhibitor. It works uh, against G12C. And what we saw at ASCO and was published uh, simultaneously in the prestigious New England Journal of Medicine at the same time, uh, this publication of the results with this other oral inhibitor of KRAS uh, for patients with this mutation G12C. This was in previously treated patients. Uh, about 80% had received uh, a couple of lines, uh, had gotten chemo and immunotherapy and uh, the vast majority, and most had gotten two or three lines of therapy. So this was not early treatment. And that also means that it, we, we tend to see less spectacular results. The more treatment that people have, the harder the nut is to crack, and we often don't see major shrinkage. What I'm showing here is called a waterfall plot, and that is uh, the, the horizontal line at zero means no change in the, uh, in the size of the measurable disease. When the, the bars are going down, that's each bar is an individual patient's outcome, and the uh, depth of downward uh, direction, that length is related to how much shrinkage there was. If the bars are going up, that is representing a patient where the disease increased. And what you can see here is that the vast majority of the people who got this therapy had some tumor shrinkage. It was called a uh, a partial or complete response or an objective response in 43%. Uh, that means that a lot of patients had shrinkage that just wasn't enough to call it officially major, uh, or they had something else that might have grown a tiny little bit while others didn't, et cetera. It's a, it's a complex system, but lots, and in fact, most of the patients had some shrinkage of their cancer. Many had uh, quite significant shrinkage. DCR stands for disease control rate, and that is shrinkage or at least not growing. So four out of five patients had their cancer uh, shrink or not grow. And uh, the median time before the cancer progressed, half the patients progressed, half food haven't, is about six and a half months. And the duration of response was on average or median uh, eight and a half months. So half had had it progress before, half after that. Uh, these results are, I would say, encouraging, but we need to bear in mind that we ha already have a drug with somewhat similar results that's commercially on the market. We also need to look at the other side of the coin, which is uh, progression, or um, rather toxicity. And you can see from the table that uh, these are the side effects that people had and uh, that uh, diarrhea nausea, vomiting, and fatigue, all relatively common, uh, but grade three and four are, uh, are increasingly severe, and those were not common. However, we had a lot of patients who had dose interruptions or dose reductions. Not very many came off drug, but a lot uh, did need to adjust the dose downward. And I would also raise the point that we often, in when we're analyzing the efficacy of these drugs, focus on uh, what are grade three or higher, more severe side effects. But these are drugs that we intend or hope for patients to take for many months or a year or more at a time. And so having drugs that are just modestly nausea-inducing or modest diarrhea or rash or something like that 
gets to people uh, after a while. This is not the same as measuring a chemo that people are on for just a month or two, and then you're off. These are things that are meant to be longitudinal. And I think it matters uh, how tolerable a drug is, even if it's not necessarily prohibitive toxicity. Uh, so, and then finally, there was a separate analysis of this agent looking at patients with untreated brain metastases and showing in a relatively small number of patients that you could achieve a lot of uh, shrinkage of some of these and uh, of these untreated brain metastases. We really haven't seen that looked at very much with sotoracid, lumacras, the drug we have now. So um, I'll open it up first to Jerushka and ask, what do you think of these data, uh, the so-called uh, the uh, uh, overall balance of efficacy and tolerability here. Uh, is this uh, some incremental benefit over what we already have, whether it's in overall efficacy or brain specific efficacy, um, or is this you know redundant, something we already have and or too concerning for side effects to be better than what we already have? Yeah, well, I think, uh, firstly, it's gratifying to see the KRAS G12C floodgates open. This is, um, this is a big problem in lung cancer. This is uh, an aggressive subtype of disease that for many years we knew patients who had this subtype of lung cancer maybe did even more poorly than, than their counterparts. So I think there is certainly room in a field for more than one agent. Um, and uh, like we've seen with say the checkpoint inhibitors, some may suit certain groups uh, better than others. Um, I think here broadly, my take home message from these data is that in terms of response, so in terms of benefit to the patient um, and uh, you know, tumor shrinkage and some of the other parameters that Jack summarized for us, these data are very similar to the medication that we already have called sotorasib. I think what was new was the information that was presented on brain metastases. Uh, I think it's unclear whether this is necessarily an advance compared to the other agent because we just aren't aware of those data in, in that circumstance. But I think it has very practical implications for a patient who has this type of lung cancer that has spread to their brain. And my take home message is, there is some activity in the brain, but again, as Gilberto mentioned before, this may be a mutation specific subset of lung cancer, but it appears to be behaving quite differently to some of the others. In some of the others, for example, in EGFR mutant lung cancer or in ALK rearranged lung cancer, we have seen more and more targeted therapies have benefit in their response in the brain. And some of the newer agents have really amazing responses in the brain. I think in this subset of lung cancer, we have a bit of a ways to go there. And I think um, particularly for from a brain perspective, um, really not a slam dunk as such from, from the brain met perspective, but a very reasonable starting point. In terms of the toxicity, my understanding is that there is some question regarding the formulation of the medication, that it's in capsule form, and that if it may uh, be changed to a tablet form, we may see some um, lessening of the GI side effects. So let's see how that pans out. But your point is very well taken that uh, toxicity, um, and obviously this is another area of interest in mind, toxicity is not just about one time point. It's about the duration of that toxicity and a patient's journey on that treatment. So certainly something that we should take into account. Account. And Gilberto, what are your thoughts here globally? Uh, do you think that, you know, there has been a bit of a battle of uh, efficacy of, of uh, say, ALK inhibitors, second or third generation ALK inhibitors, as, which is maybe most effective, but it's hard to know if there's any meaningful difference except in how much companies focus on, you know, telling that story and creating a narrative. I mean, what is your gestalt here? And would you, particularly if you have someone with KRAS, mutation positive disease, and brain metastases, does, does that person get special consideration for adagrasib over any other options, whether it's the other pill, uh, Lumacras, or chemoimmunotherapy? 
Not necessarily. While this is certainly new and it's the first time that we're seeing formally presented data with responses in the central nervous system, I would be hard pressed to tell you that satorasib or dagrasib is any better than the one than the other. Uh, we do have some maybe emerging information in the lab showing that the mutations in about 40% of patients who have a failure of treatment by either satorasib or dagrasib seem to have a secondary mutation or more than one secondary mutation. And there seem to be some evidence that's still too early for us uh, to find it conclusive that maybe a dagrasib has some activity to some of the mutations that develop while you're on uh, satorasib, but we don't know that for sure yet. So it's too early for us to say that any of them is better than the other. In terms of access, that is without a doubt the main issue we have globally. This, these are not medications that have been approved yet. While the FDA has created mechanisms to bring drugs in a provisional or early way into the market based on response rates and not necessarily on showing that this is better than the old standards in terms of progression-free or overall survival, how long patients live, uh, most countries around the world don't necessarily have that specific mechanism so it does take a little longer. And then, well, of course, we have to strike a balance between safety and efficacy. And uh, we have been lucky that our patients can have access early, although sometimes you will have some examples of medications that seem to be useful and uh, end up not being. I can say I have seen that in lung cancer recently. Uh, we do have a few uh, older stories with um, uh, monoclonal antibodies that targeted EGFR, and a few other drugs as well. But for specific precision medicine agents, we haven't seen um, approvals retracted. If anything, the one that was retracted, Jafitnib, 20 years ago, we probably rejected by mistake because we didn't select patients with right. the right target. So I would say that we do need to work on that. And having said that, of course, we do need ways in which these drugs could become more affordable in countries where we can't pay $10,000 to $20,000 a month for medications.